Spire wants to become a mini Hendrick. Kyle Larson responds to Bristol criticism on Twitter. And NASCAR is baffled by Goodyear. Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. The Door Bumper Clear guys are at it again. Once again, they stirred the pot on this week's episode, but they're not wrong in what they said once again. Obviously, they're coming off the heels of the whole Justin Haley contract situation at Hendrick. Does he have a Hendrick contract? This and that. And when discussing Justin Haley moving over to the Spire number seven car uh, for the rest of the season starting this weekend in Kansas, they mentioned that Spire is looking to become a tier one Chevrolet team, leapfrogging RCR and Trackhouse. Essentially, they want to become a mini Hendrick Motorsports. And now if you've been paying close attention, that shouldn't shock you at all. Spire Motorsports and Hendrick Motorsports have a very close relationship as it is. Spire does not have the manufacturer support that Hendrick does, that Trackhouse does, that RCR does. Uh, so them wanting to become a tier one status, that's pretty interesting news. They essentially want to become like Stuart Haas Racing when they were partnered up with Hendrick under that technical alliance that they had. So... But it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that this is a conversation that's been going on. Hendrick Motorsports has a great relationship with Spire Motorsports. I mean, this year at the Brickyard 400, when I was walking around pit road, Chack and House is climbing up on top of the seven box. He's looking around uh, all their pit areas. There's a close relationship here. I mean, Steve Latart went over there uh, to become a consultant after he stepped away from Hendrick Motorsports and went to television. Uh, they have had Hendrick companies as sponsors over at Spire Motorsports. I mean, heck, Roger Cruz number 71 truck this year is fully sponsored by Hendrick Cars. Dot com and there was a lot of talk about Alex Bowman potentially moving to the seven car at Spire, Justin Haley into the 48. Who knows what's going to happen with that in the future? There's a strong relationship there, is what I'm saying. So this really shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. The biggest surprise with them being would be be them getting tier one status, leapfrogging over RCR, a stalwart in the Chevy camp, leaping over Trackhouse, who felt like they were the new young guys on uh, on track, right? They're the ones that are going to come in and help bring this like youth movement to the sport. Maybe they're next in line to be potentially become one of those top Chevy teams. I mean, it felt like that until, of course, Ross Chastain and Justin Marks had to go kiss Rick Hendrick's ring after wrecking Kyle Larson at Darlington and that whole fallout from that in 2023. But for the most part, it felt like Trackhouse was probably next up in a sense, but Spire Motorsports has come in and people are wondering where Spire getting all their money from. And when you look at the listed owners of Spire Motorsports, Jeff Dickerson and TJ Pusher, you're like, OK, well, like that's who the owners are. Maybe, right? They're the figureheads. They're the faces of the organization. But a lot of this uh, Spire money is coming from Dan Towers and Gamebridge. There is a ton of money behind Sp uh, Spire Motorsports. And whatever it takes for them to become a race winning championship contending race team, they are willing to do. So them becoming a tier one Chevy team. Yeah, that's not that big of a surprise if it does happen, which I would expect it to because there's a great relationship, like I said, between Hendrick Motorsports, obviously the top of the Chevy camp, and Spire Motorsports, somebody who wants to be essentially a mini Hendrick. Think about how 2311 Racing and Joe Gibbs Racing interact. It's essentially a six-car team. They have comp meetings together. They share all the information, but they're two separate teams. This would essentially be a seven-car team, uh, seven -car team Obviously, four at Hendrick Motorsports, three at Spire. They would share a lot of the same information. All the cars are still going to be prepped out of Spire shop. Spire's still going to take care of building and doing all of that. But there's a reason that Rodney Childers went over there. There's a reason Spire is spending all the money they are. They're buying new things. They're upgrading their shop. They bought Kyle Busch Motorsports because they needed a bigger shop. They bought the entire truck team because they're like, oh, well, we want the shop. We might as well buy the truck team as well here. They're spending a lot of money. It makes sense, and it would give Hendrick the perfect spot to develop drivers at in the Cup Series. It gives them a uh, essentially a, um, a a truck team to develop guys at as well. Maybe you'll even see them do Xfinity stuff, although Hendrick does run that Xfinity program out of their own shop as well. Expect to see somebody else get announced for that, that probably being Corey Day. Uh, not probably, definitely being Corey Day. So uh, Spire wanting to become a mini Hendrick isn't a shock. But them getting tier one Chevy status and potentially the relationship that could come along with that with Hendrick Motorsports uh, should certainly open some people's eyes. Kyle Larson doesn't tweet very often, but when he does, you know it's coming from Kyle Larson and not from one of his PR reps, which is really nice to see an organic interaction or an organic post from a NASCAR driver that's not just all corporate PR speaking. Kyle Larson, Blunt Larson, doesn't really care for the corporate PR speak at that. So this past week, Jeff Gluck, of course, posted his Was It A Good Race poll following the Bristol night race, and it only got a 27%, the lowest rated race in the history of the Gluck poll, stemming back, what, uh, 19 races at Bristol that he's done this. That's uh, not great. 
actually bad, as some people would consider it. So Kyle Larson saw that, and he responded, and he's not wrong with what he said. Larson said, lead 450 laps, but have two overtime restarts and lose, and I guarantee the percentage is flip-flopped. That's our fan base. So there's certainly some fans that are going to be upset about that, but he's not wrong in what he said. Essentially, what happened at Bristol on Saturday night kind of broke the fan base's brain. Not every race is a banger. Not every NFL game uh, goes down to the final minute. And if it does, you can the Chiefs are playing. You can guarantee that they're going to get the calls from the ref in that situation. But for NASCAR, sometimes dominant performances happen. And why this one has become such a catalyst for the fan base to be like, everything's broken, everything's ruined is perplexing to me because we've seen bad races in the Gen 7 era. We've seen bad races in the Gen 6 era. Not every race is good. And I get it. It's the Bristol night race. Everybody has this expectation of Bristol when they go there and what type of race they want to see. You're not always going to get that. So Kyle Larson's not wrong. If that race had a two overtime finish there at the end, he'd end up not winning the race. And there's like a close ish finish at the end and not seven seconds like how he won by. Yeah, that percentage is probably up closer to 50 50, if not 60 40, because people remember a close finish more than they remember how bad like the previous, you know, 490 laps were of that race. So Larson wasn't wrong there. He then came back and doubled down on Went Tuesday. Honestly, this is where I wish that X and Elon Musk just did not give everybody essentially unlimited amount of characters because it allows people to post novels to Twitter and it becomes a lot to read. But I'm going to go ahead and go through what Larson said here real quick. Larson says, all this tire wear talk about Bristol got me wondering, have we ever had a lot of tire wear at Bristol besides the spring of 24? Eh, not much of any. Have we seen great races there? Absolutely. Have we seen duds where Kyle Busch leads 300 plus laps? Sure. From what I remember in my career, before the next gen car was we had cars with some disparity that could run closer to one another in traffic and a wheel tire combo that got hotter which in essence gave us less grip on the long run i've run with 900 horsepower all the way down to 650 horsepower or less potentially high downforce low downforce and everything in between bristol always has been tough to pass speed on pit road and most likely there's a good chance that you're going to go a lap down on the next run that's the way it is and has been for a very long time we had more natural cautions from rex because cars could run closer and we never quite made it a fuel fuel run uh, because eventually someone's right front would uh, tire would explode from overheating. I'm not saying I want tires to explode again, but we're trying to crutch this race car on short tracks with the tire and then blame Goodyear every week because the cars can't pass. I don't have an answer to fix what we currently have, and neither do you, but please stop blaming Goodyear. It's not a tire problem. And also, have any of you ran around Bristol with or without PJ1 or resin for that matter? That's right. So zip face emoji, temper your expectations, we're driving spec race cars. Listen. That's not going to make some people at NASCAR headquarters happy. Is what he said wrong? Absolutely not. The Bristol's always been difficult to pass, whether it's the single lane conveyor belt on the bottom Bristol or even multi lane Bristol like we've seen for the last 15 you know, ish years. Passing at Bristol is difficult. Passing at Bristol now is more difficult than it used to be because you have two distinct lanes. Before you would just go in, bump and run somebody and gain a position. Is that racing? That's a debate for another day. But what we have right now at Bristol you can pass. It's difficult to pass. He's not wrong about getting mired back in traffic. That typically isn't good for your run. Unless you have a really dominant race car, there's a chance that you will go a lap down. The spec race car series, I think that's the part that's going to make some people upset. NASCAR has mentioned, and Jeff Gluck talked about it on their podcast this week, about a spec series. Essentially, NASCAR wants to put the, uh, the ability in the driver's hand. Everybody's essentially driving the same race car. Drivers will make the difference here. The problem is this car just doesn't race very well. Maybe Denny Hamill said on his podcast, whatever. Uh, the car just doesn't race well around each other, especially on short tracks. Intermediates, this car is an absolute banger. It's the panacea, as Steve Phelps says. It fixed, short, it fixed intermediates. And it did a great job there. On short tracks, not so much. And Larson's not wrong. We do go into this blaming Goodyear for not bringing a tire that wears out, but it's not Goodyear's fault. He's right. We don't really typically have a high tire wear race at Bristol. It's just not something that we typically have seen in years past. Being concrete uh, certainly plays into that unless something weird happens like we had back in the spring at Bristol as well. Now, obviously, we all you know like the amount of tire wear we saw uh, at Bristol in the spring. That was interesting. We didn't like what we saw on Saturday night, and now everybody's quick to blame Goodyear in the situation. Myself included, like I've said, I said on a video the other day, Goodyear needs to do better. They need to bring a more consistent tire. They need to bring a tire that wears out more. I stand by that because I've been saying that for, you know, literal years at this point. But 
there's an inherent problem with a car on short tracks. It's not necessarily the tires. We have a flawed race car and we're trying to make up for it with tires. And unfortunately, the blame's getting passed off onto Goodyear when honestly, it's a multi blame area. But blaming people right now is not going to fix the issue, right? We can go around all day and be like, NASCAR, you designed a bad car. Delari, you did a terrible job. Goodyear, you're doing a bad job over here and everywhere in between. That's not productive. It's not solving anything. So what Larson's saying isn't wrong, but I know some people are going to get upset about that and they absolutely shouldn't because at the end of the day, it's not a tire issue, it's a car issue. And if everybody's running the same speed, that's kind of where we end up at, like what we had on Saturday night. Passing could happen though. I mean, Larson did lap up to 10, so somebody was out there passing race cars. Today's video is sponsored by Lockdown Brand. Head over to lockdownbrand.com today for your motorsports inspired apparel. Their shirts are absolutely phenomenal. Their hats equally as great. Use code BREAKHARD10 at checkout to save 10%. Also, do not forget that there is now a Break Hard blog as well. I'm posting about two to three times a week. I will have my Monday morning cool down lap out on Monday morning. So go ahead and sign up. You have it delivered to your inbox by clicking the link that is down in the description below. Speaking of the tires at Bristol, NASCAR uh, Vice President Elton Sawyer went on to SiriusXM NASCAR on Tuesday morning, kind of doing his weekly hit recapping things that happened this weekend. And he talked about the tire and the lack of wear and kind of the expectations going into the weekend. And he said, quote, we're baffled to be completely honest. We felt like we had a recipe there from the spring that gave us what we were looking for in our short track racing. And then obviously it didn't happen. So the goal for the Bristol Night Race was to essentially have a repeat of what we had back in the spring. They did a tire test there in July, recreated the same problems with a higher ambient air temperature. And everyone's like, okay, so this is what we can expect when we get back here. And we didn't get that. Instead of the tires lasting 40 laps, they lasted 200 laps and with not that much fall off. Goodyear, of course, and their rep said that they have about a second of fall off. Uh, Denny, you know, on his podcast did a really good job breaking it down. Go ahead and listen to like the first 15 to 20 minutes of Actions Detrimental. I know people don't like Denny, but he did a good job breaking it down in the tire situation there. Um, so yeah, I think even NASCAR was a little bit baffled by what they said. And they go on to say, obviously, we were disappointed as a company for our fans. And quote, when we get to our... Oh, no. So yeah, I mean, everybody was disappointed leaving Bristol. NASCAR, Goodyear, fans, everybody included. Because it wasn't like a false advertisement type of situation, but they were, everybody had been hyping up this race as like, man, remember the spring, we're gonna get the same thing here. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be wild. Uh, we had essentially a multi-class race in the spring, people on new tires, people on old tires, and man, there was a ton of passing, um, but not in like the traditional sense of passing, more of like people trying to survive on their tires, people on new tires out there feeling like an absolute Superman. And it created for an intriguing race, and then we expect that going into Saturday and we don't get it. Instead, we got essentially the same Bristol that we had last fall, just with one guy out there completely dominating and then everybody lost their minds in the post race. For me, I mean, Goodyear's trying, right? I know I was critical the other day, they are trying. They're bringing a softer tire. They're taking a very soft tire to Martinsville. Hopefully that helps out uh, the track there. It will be cooler when we get to Martinsville in October. So maybe it'll be better. Oh, that's gonna be in November, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's gonna be a little bit chilly there. So maybe the, the tire will have the same sort of reaction that it did at the uh, Bristol Spring Race. Who knows? The biggest disappointment to me is the fact that NASCAR and Goodyear are taking the same tire they had at Phoenix back in the spring back to Phoenix this fall. And Elton said, quote, when we get to our championship weekend, we want our teams and drivers to have a real understanding of what they're walking into. And while on one hand, I completely understand that, right? It's a championship race. You don't want to throw in this wild variable. But if you just give them like 45 minutes of practice time, then it really shouldn't be that big of an issue. I'll let people get a grasp on sort of the tire situation and what's going into that. And instead, it feels like we're sacrificing our championship race and a potentially good race with a different tire on it in the name of like, well, we want to make sure that everybody's, you know, safe. Everybody has a level playing field here. And that's not entertaining for the fans that tune in to watch because as soon as Chris Rebell or Kyle Larson or Tyler Reddick or whoever makes the championship race gets out front, chances are they're going to stay out front. And that is going to be a big time disappointment because Phoenix just hasn't produced very good racing in the better part of 30 plus years at this point, barring like maybe one fun race in like 2007 or 2008. Other than that, 
It just hasn't been good. So NASCAR's baffled by Goodyear's uh, lack of wear. Goodyear's baffled by what happened out here. Kyle Larson's tired of people saying that Bristol's changed and we need to have higher tire wear. But yeah, let me know in the comments what you think about Spire wanting to become any, a mini Hendrick. Kyle Larson's comments plus NASCAR being baffled by what happened with the uh, Goodyear tire at Bristol. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Block.